Let's be honest, this is not the best year to say Merry Christmas. Many of you will have empty chairs at the table this year. Others, like me, couldn't even make it home for the holidays. And every one of us, in one way or another, will celebrate a bittersweet end to 2020. But despite all of this, this is still Christmas, a time to find optimism even when it seems impossible. And this is why, no matter what, this year we want to offer you some good news as a Christmas treat. Let's get started. midnight on 4th of November 2020, just a few hours after voting closed on the elections that would ultimately cost him the Oval Office, US President Donald Trump managed to see one of his great commitments fulfilled, the withdrawal of the United States from the so-called Paris Agreement. The American power thus disassociated itself from one of the most important global agreements ever reached. To give you an idea, at the time of making this video, 196 countries had signed this agreement and 188 more had ratified it throughout the world. The Paris Agreement was first adopted at the Paris Climate Conference, COP21, on 12th of December 2015. In this agreement, the signatory countries essentially committed themselves to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. But take note, because this was the great novelty. They did so by accepting the duty of having to present concrete plans on how they intended to comply with their negotiated objectives. Not only that, but the obligation for all member countries to report periodically on their emissions and efforts to carry out their plans was also incorporated into the agreement. In other words, the Paris Agreement sought to go far beyond a mere declaration of intent. But now, the United States, the second most polluting country after China, has decided to abandon the agreement. Although it will be somewhat temporary because Joe Biden has already stated his intention to rejoin it. The thing is that this toing and froing has made us here at Visual Politic ask ourselves a few questions. What does this agreement entail? Or rather, what hope is there that its goals will actually be met? To answer these questions, we have decided to take a look at how things stand in the activity that accounts for around three quarters, that's almost 75% of all CO2 emissions. I'm talking about power generation. But what are the sources of energy, electricity, heat, and combustion on which the whole world economy is based? How have these sources changed over the last few years. How is energy changing and why? What could the departure of the United States from the Paris Agreement mean for the rest of the world? Dear friends, in this video we're going to see how many of the preconceived ideas we will have are, in one way or another, wrong. I think many of you are going to be quite surprised by a lot of the things we're going to tell you today. Are you ready to look inside the great engine of the world and see how it's changing? Well, let's get started. <laughs> Friends, energy consumption has three main forms, electricity, transportation, and heat generation. Together, they account for almost three quarters of all carbon dioxide emissions. Because the truth is that today, the engine that keeps the world moving runs on dirty energy. Fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas account for 79% of our global energy production. So far, I doubt that any of this is surprising to any of you. However, hold on a moment because during the last few years, there have been two very pronounced trends. On the one hand, although its consumption increased slightly in absolute terms, the importance of coal in the world's energy supply has decreased over the last decade. A decade that began with very high expectations for this fuel. You see, the decade that began in the year 2000 saw the greatest growth in demand for coal in history. The economic takeoff of China, whose energy network is mainly fed by coal, the Asian giant is responsible for almost half of all the world's coal production, meant that during those 10 years, the demand for this fuel grew more than during the previous four decades combined. At the beginning of this century, everything pointed to the fact that China's unstoppable economic growth, together with the budding takeoff of India, another country addicted to coal, would also boost coal consumption over the following decade. However, this did not happen. Between 2010 and 2019, the trend for coal demand was not positive. And in fact, in 2019, the demand for coal was lower than it had been in 2013. The growing environmental concerns represented by the Paris Agreement 
agreement itself, along with the natural gas revolution in the United States brought on as a consequence of fracking, which released huge amounts of natural gas and caused prices to plummet, sank the US giant's coal consumption by 40%. All of this, by the way, was excellent news. The decrease in the use of coal explained 75% of the reduction in CO2 emissions that the United States registered between 2005 and 2017. And then in Europe, something similar happened. Growing environmental awareness, lower gas prices, new liquefied natural gas capabilities, and the new emissions trading scheme caused the share of coal in power generation to sink by 50%. But wait a minute, because the emergence of gas was by no means the only reason for the drop in the use of coal. What is certain is that during the last decade, we have witnessed the beginning of a whole revolution, that of renewable energies, particularly wind and solar energy. Do you want an example? The global capacity of photovoltaic solar energy has increased almost 20 times during the last decade. We are talking about a shift that not even the coronavirus has managed to stop. In fact, to give you an idea, the International Energy Agency estimates that by the end of 2020, world energy demand will have been reduced by 5%, and investment by almost 20%. However, despite this, investment in renewables has grown. It is estimated that by 2020 alone, 198 gigawatts of renewable capacity will have been installed, an almost 90% increase in the entire global energy capacity. Yep, that's what I said, 90%. For example, if we look at electricity, renewable sources already account for 27% of all production globally. And that's not all. The International Energy Agency expects that in the next five years alone, electricity production from renewable energy will grow by another 50% to 9,745 terawatt hours, the equivalent of the combined current demand of China and the entire European Union. This is an expectation that is consistent with the trends of recent years. Friends, we are talking about some simply amazing numbers. The International Energy Agency's forecast is that renewables will cover 99%, yes, that's right, 99% of the entire increase in global electricity demand over the period 2020 to 2025. And this is no pie in the sky either. Most projects are already planned or are in the research phase. You don't have to dig too deep to see that many energy multinationals have announced investments of tens and tens of billions in renewables. Quite simply, we are facing a historic change. And it's not just about electricity generation today. The importance of renewable energies is also going to grow stronger in the other two energy uses, heat generation and of course, transport. Surely you have all seen news like this. Now, having come this far, I am sure absolutely sure that there is a question many of you are asking yourselves. I am certainly asking myself this question. What on earth could explain this almost disruptive change that has begun to take place over the last few years? Why are renewables growing so strongly? Any ideas? Well, listen up, because the answer may surprise many of you. Why bet on renewable energies? Why are so many multinationals concentrating their investments in this sector? Is it just a matter of following the guidelines set by politicians or agreements like the one in Paris? Or is there something else? Isn't it strange that even countries like China have joined this kind of trend? Yes. Okay, environmental awareness, social concern, responsibility, all of that, friends, is all well and good, but let's not fool ourselves. In order to carry out a change, a transition, a revolution, that means transforming the entire model of world energy production, something else is needed. Energy needs to be competitive. The cost and the profit and loss account all need to balance that disruption. 
you know what? It may surprise you, but that's exactly what's happening. What we are going to show you next is not a green argument or anything like that. This is visual politic. What we're going to show you is nothing but the numbers, the raw reality of the data. Friends, over the last decade, if we look at both the construction of production plants, for example, a natural gas combined cycle power plant or a wind farm, and at the use, fuel and operations themselves, what we find is that the costs of renewable energy have plummeted. These are the facts to take away. The cost of onshore wind energy has fallen by 70% and the cost of solar energy by almost 90%. And that's without counting subsidies of any kind. Today, this is already a fact. For new projects, onshore wind and solar energy are on average much cheaper than energy from coal or natural gas. And that is precisely why the vast majority of new electricity production capacity is renewable. As a side note, there are other reports that calculate the cost of nuclear energy even lower, but renewables are still competitive. Anyway, we'll talk about that in a future video. The fact is that, as you can see, just a decade ago, every megawatt hour produced in a solar photovoltaic plant cost three times as much as one produced in a coal-fired power plant. Today, the cost of a solar megawatt hour is less than half of that of coal, as long as we're talking about new plants, of course. If, for example, you already have a gas plant built, then during its lifetime, the production costs for gas will obviously be almost certainly lower. But if we start from scratch, then it's a different story. In fact, new photovoltaic solar energy installations are beginning to have costs that place them among the cheapest energy sources in history. And the same could be said of wind energy. Not only that, the estimate is that over the next few years, the cost of this energy will continue to fall sharply. So the question, the big question we can ask ourselves is, how on earth has this been possible? Well, dear friends of visual politic, this has to do with the characteristics of each production system. Let me explain. While the cost of electricity generated by fossil fuels depends largely on the price of the fuel itself, gas, oil or coal for example, the same does not apply to renewable energy, no. In the case of wind or solar energy, their cost is almost entirely linked to the cost of the technology. And what about the price of the technology? Well, the story is very similar to what happened with microchips cell phones or data, that production costs fall as the technology develops. The combined experience, the accumulation of technological advances, the small changes that increase efficiency, it is a sum of elements that in the end makes technology more and more accessible. For example, existing data and studies show that every time the installed solar capacity has doubled, there has been a 36% drop in costs. In the case of onshore wind energy, the figure has been 20%, and in the case of offshore wind energy, 10% take a look. Thus, although electricity produced from coal has historically been cheap, compared to photovoltaic solar energy, it is becoming relatively more expensive. Why? Well, because in addition to the fact that the technology is already highly refined, the cost of coal is a weighty factor. In fact, coal accounts for about 40% of the total costs of a coal-fired power plant. And this, my friends, is what explains why renewables have become the stars of the energy world. And that, that is a change that not even the President of the United States can stop. So what I can say is this is fantastic news. On the one hand, we're talking about a much cheaper energy and that in itself means more prosperity and a better quality of life for everyone. Take note, because that's not the only benefit. The progressive replacement of energy, especially coal plants by renewable energy ones, will also reduce carbon dioxide emissions and pollution of all kinds, and that could prevent the loss of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lives, millions even, each year. Yes, that's right. International organizations estimate that between five and eight million people die every year due to pollution. So you see, renewables seem like good news that open the door to a very hopeful future. Cleaner and cheaper energy, what more could you ask for? Of course, not everything is so beautiful. There are still issues that need to be resolved, such as the reliability of these technologies. What happens if the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow? So far, renewable energies need a backup structure that in many cases is hardly ever used, but has to be paid for nonetheless. We have not included this cost. If we had done so, renewables would still be competitive somewhat less so, but with a tendency towards decreasing costs. However, perhaps this can be resolved with the future development of macro energy storage systems, or perhaps this technology will always have to coexist with others. But in any case, replacing coal with solar, for example, well, what can I say? It seems like fantastic news. <laughs> 
fact, do you know who is betting heavily, very heavily, in fact, on photovoltaic solar energy? You'll be amazed. The Petro Monarchies of the Persian Gulf. In short, my friends, these are the key components to today's global energy system. I think you now have a better understanding of the renewable energy revolution that has been set in motion over the past few years. The question, the million dollar question is, will we all soon enjoy increased access to much cheaper energy or will our politicians savagely tax it so that nothing changes? Leave your answers in the comments. Before we finish, we can't end this video without wishing you all the best for the holidays even though we already know this probably won't be anyone's best holiday ever. We also want to pass on our deepest condolences to every one of you who has lost an important person during this pandemic. But despite all of that, the whole team here at Visual Politic wants to wish you all a happy holidays. I've got my whiskey and as a Scotsman, that means mine will be. So cheers, Merry Christmas, and we'll see you next time.